Okay, we are talking about autism and liver health and all that, all as it has to do with the amino acid arginine, what I call super amino acid. What makes this program really an original program, and unlike any other radio program that you're going to hear, is that we focus here on the bright side, we focus on the causes of disease. We don't focus so much on the symptoms, the symptomology. We spent a couple days last week talking about fibroids. If you have fibroids, we said, you want to focus on estrogen issues, insulin issues, digestive issues. These aren't directly, these aren't directly linked to fibroids. They're directly linked to health. And this is the whole premise of this program, and this is why I call the show The Bright Side. We want to focus on the health of the body. Let the body take care of the fibroids. Let the body take care of the depression. Let the body take care of the diseases. Focus on the health of the system, and the system will focus on the, sim on the symptoms. The system will take care of the symptoms. If you have fibroids, use fat absorption strategies, digestive enzymes, lecithin, the biolumin nightly essence, in addition to, of course, the healthy start pack, which will give you the basics. Pancreatin can help with all fat absorption issues. I love pancreatic enzymes. There's a reason why pancreatic cancer is the number one killer cancer and the hardest cancer to recover from and the one that kills you the fastest is because the pancreas is super mega mega important but if we're eating a lot of sugar if we're indulging in the standard american diet it makes sense that the pancreas would get pooped out why the pancreas is a, an enzyme factory the enzyme is an enzyme the pancreas is an enzyme factory for sugars and for fats and for proteins when the pancreas is pooped out, we don't digest our foods as well. The liver will become, uh, the liver can become toxic, and you won't even link it to the, you won't even link it to the pancreas. Once the liver becomes toxic, the fibroids can start to show up, and you're not even going to link it to the, to the pancreas. Once the liver becomes toxic, hormone metabolism breaks down, estrogenic cancers and estrogenic symptoms are likely to arise, and nobody's going to think to link it to the pancreas. This is what I'm talking about. When I say focus on the health of the body and the body will take care of the symptoms. If you have fibroids, treat yourself as a pre-diabetic. Stay away from blood sugar spiking foods. Use the sweeties. Chromium and vanadium are two incredibly important minerals for helping us process sugar. Think about progesterone cream or, pre or pregnenolone. Use selenium, which is a estrogen balancing mineral. Vitamins A and E, estrogen balancing vitamins. These are all in the interest of changing the biochemical environment that causes the fibroids or that leads to the fibroids. Does this kind of protocol sound familiar? It should because we talk about it every day, whether we're talking about autism or fibroids or acne, cardiovascular disease. This is, this is so, uh, this cuts to the chase. This simplifies everything. Yesterday we were talking about autism, a childhood mental health issue that is very similar to schizophrenia. It's a type of schizophrenia, in my opinion. And autism, as we said yesterday, has become an epidemic. It's gone from one in every 15,000 or so uh, children in uh, 19, late 70s and 80s to now one out of every 68. That's a 150 time increase. In the case of autism, or for that matter, schizophrenia, mood issues, so socialization issues, abilities to relate, communication issues, as well as the frustration and anger and emotional outbursts that are characteristic of autism, as well as schizophrenia, or from a physiologic standpoint, brain dysfunctions, problems with the organ called the brain. The other major symptomology for autis autistic kids and schizophrenics is digestive issues. And autistic kids and schizophrenics have well-described, well-defined digestive issues and microbiome issues. The microbiome is the universe of bacteria that lives in the intestine. Can we link digestive issues to schizophrenia? Can we link digestive issues to mental issues in general? Absolutely, positively, should come as no surprise if you've been listening to this program. When foods aren't processed correctly, we end up with changes in bacterial proliferation, the types of bacteria, how fast they're growing, changes in what they're producing, toxic gases and waste gets secreted in the blood. This is all from poor digestion. We don't digest our foods, especially our sugars, to a certain extent our fats and proteins also. Toxic gases and, and waste get secreted into the blood from bacteria that are growing inappropriately. Between incompletely processed foods, little chunks of food that enter in the blood, food particles that literally get, get uh, 
uh, leak into the bloodstream through the intestines and bacterial waste in the blood, the scene is set for major nervous system toxicity. This is autism and schizophrenia in a nutshell. You go to a psychiatrist, you tell them your kid's got autism, or you get diagnosed with autism. Do you think they're going to check his digestive system? Do you think they're going to tell, tell you to, to uh, get off of gluten or get off of grains or focus on constipation or diarrhea or digestive complaints? Probably not, although these days it's becoming more and more recognized. Changes in gut bacteria can be caused and can in turn cause. They can be caused by and they can in turn cause incomplete processing of sugar and starch. These sugars and the subsequent bacterial toxins make their way through the intestinal wall. Like all sugars, all sugars get in through, into the blood through the intestinal wall, but when they're incompletely digested, the same thing can happen and then they enter into the liver all the sugars that go through the di in, uh, intestinal wall go into the blood and they go through the liver for processing. There's a special vein called the portal vein. Some of you may have heard of something called portal hypertension. That's when the liver gets all blocked up from being toxic and the, the blood backs up. In any case, the portal vein runs from the intestine into the liver and all the sugars, as well as the bacterial waste, get into the, and toxins from food for that matter, get into the liver and from there, the liver does its magic and it is magic. That's the only thing you can call it, what the liver does. Hundreds, thousands really, of different kinds of reactions occur in the liver. The liver's storing and processing sugar, it's detoxifying poisons, it's processing amino acids. Over time, the liver becomes overloaded and this is where it all goes sour. I'm Pharmacist Ben. We'll continue this discussion when we come back from... Okay, so autism and schizophrenia, mental health issues, they don't seem to be linked to the digestive system, but they are. It doesn't kind of... It's not intuitive. You wouldn't necessarily think that the digestive system is linked to the brain, but it is. You eat the wrong foods. Your foods aren't processed correctly. You're not making enough digestive enzymes. You're not secreting enough acid. This can change the population of the microbiome, the fancy way of saying the universe of bacteria in the gut. The wrong bacteria proliferate, toxins get into the blood. The uh, liver has to filter out those toxins. Blood, food goes, all the, a lot of the food, not all of it, but a lot of the food goes into the liver through the portal vein. The liver's got to process everything. Over the time, as toxins accumulate through the digestive system, they end up in the liver. The liver becomes overloaded, not good. If all disease starts off in the digestive system, and it does, all disease starts off in the digestive system. Degenerative chronic disease I'm talking about here. All chronic, long-term degenerative disease. A degenerative disease which accounts for most of our health care costs and most of our health misery in this country. A degenerative disease, arthritis, or autoimmune problems, or cancer, or even acne, or heart disease, or eh, pretty much what we call diseases are degenerative, and that means they don't get better. They don't heal. That's the definition of a degenerative disease. We always say at the beginning of this program that the body is a regenerating system. It is designed divinely to regenerate, to heal. Every time you cut yourself, you could see this regenerating process kick in. However, a degenerative disease is when this doesn't occur. Something mucks up the system. That's all. Something is mucking up the system. We said there's two kinds of muck-ups. There's two kinds of stresses. There's negative muck-ups, negative stresses, and positive muck-ups, positive stresses, positive burdens, negative burdens. A negative burden is something that's missing. A positive burden is something that's coming in that shouldn't be coming in. Negative burdens mean nutrition, or oxygen perhaps, or maybe water, which is a type of nutrient. Positive burdens are the, for the most part, from a physical standpoint, foods. That's, that should be such good news, you guys, because that means there's no doctor that, can, that we need to go to. The doctor can't help us, and we don't need to go to a doctor for degenerative disease. We simply have to replace what's missing, so we uh, eliminate the negative burden, replace what's missing, and remove the bad stuff. Eliminate the positive burden. When the liver becomes overloaded, everything tumbles out of control. If all disease starts off in the digestive system, the liver is the jumping off point. In our triangle of disease model, our three points of disease, which are the digestive system, the blood sugar system, and the stress system, in our, if you take that model, you got your digestive system breakdown, you got your liver dysfunction, and the liver, remember, is processing sugar too. This is the jumping off point. So you get your digestive problems, liver problems, then you get blood sugar problems, and you're into point two of our triangle of disease. Once the liver breaks down, blood sugar problems, hypoglycemia, prediabetes, diabetes, these are all very likely to occur. 
you can see the liver is like a bridge between point one and point two in our triangle of disease because it's both a digestive organ and a blood sugar organ. It's the link between the two points in the triangle of disease. And once the liver is messed up because the liver is also processing steroid hormones, you're very likely to have estrogen problems. A lot of the, a lot of the blame, a lot of the, uh, the, the problems associated with estrogen, cancer, blood clotting, anxiety, PMS, fibroids, endometriosis. A lot of the problems associated with estrogen are really associated with incompletely processed estrogen. It's not only estrogen that's a problem, it's the incompletely processed estrogen that is incompletely processed because the liver is whacked out. The liver's whacked out because our food is whacked out. All comes back to food, you guys. All comes back to nutrition. PMS, circulatory problems, weight gain, thyroid issues, even cancer are secondary to this incompletely processed estrogen, estrogen that's not completely broken down. The liver is a major steroid hormone processing center. It is the major steroid hormone processing center. That means if you're starting to have liver problems, and that includes 100 million people at least who are having liver problems, it's going to be a short jump to breast cancer, to uterine cancer, to prostate cancer, to fibroids, to anxiety, to stress, uh, uh, emotional distress, to cysts, to PMS, to endometriosis. You see where I'm going here? This is all secondary to liver, which in turn is secondary to digestion and bacteria, probiotics. And if you're a guy, it can be testosterone problems too. Low T, for example, can be related to these liver issues. You see all these commercials for low T. Well, at the same time, as you see all these commercials for androgel and uh, all the different low T treatments, at the same time, you see commercials from lawyers saying, have you uh, suffered from a heart attack because you took, got on low T or you got on a low T drug? So you got the lawyers benefiting, you got the doctors benefiting, you got the drug companies benefiting. The only people who aren't benefiting from this ridiculous drug mentality of ours is us. We're the guinea pigs. We're the suckers. We're the grist for the medical model mill. The best way to take care of your liver is, surprise, surprise, take care of your digestive system and take care of your blood sugar system. Where have you heard this before? This is for all liver issues, including hepatitis, which from a uh, uh, anti-medical model perspective and an anti-doctor perspective should be regarded as a liver issue, not a viral issue. Doctors want you to think hepatitis is a viral issue because then you just got to give up and go to the doctor. But I'm telling you, hepatitis is a liver issue, which means we have control. This whole idea of attributing outside forces, viruses and germs and Lyme disease and funguses and bacteria, this whole idea of attributing outside forces, an enemy from the outside to what really is internal biochemical issues is disempowering and it's a diversion. It empowers the model and it takes the power away from us. It allows us to abdicate responsibility. Oh, I got Lyme disease, a tick did it. Oh, I got hepatitis, I got a virus. This allows us to abdicate responsibility and it allows the medical model, which will gladly do it, it allows them to take over happily. They're glad to take over our res uh, responsibility from us. That way they can bill us. This is what uh, medicalization is about. Medicalization is the tendency for representatives of the medical model and medical corporations, really, not necessarily the individual representatives, but the corporations to take over what really should be our lifestyle decisions. I'm Pharmacist Ben. You're listening to The Bright Side. We're coming back after this. Don't go away. Continue talking about liver health and RG. We'll also talk a little bit about hepatitis. Seems to be a lot of folks confused about hepatitis A, B, C, D, E, F. All these hepatitis, the, the hepatitis alphabet, I call it. And really, it's just much ado about nothing in the sense that hepatitis is a liver problem. It's an um, inflamed liver, secondary to a viral infection, but really, it's an inflamed liver that doesn't need a doctor. In fact, there's nothing a doctor can do for hepatitis. They can give you maybe some interferon, which will cost you $1,000 a dose and isn't even going to do anything except maybe, maybe mitigate some of your symptoms. It's expensive. It's got side effects. There's nothing they can really do for hepatitis. They'll give you a, a liver transplant. If, it's, if it gets bad enough, but there's really nothing you could, a doctor can do, but there's lots we can do. We'll continue talking about that tomorrow. Okay, we are talking about arginine, and we're actually, last we spoke, we were talking about this whole idea of attributing outside forces, germs, genetics, viruses, 
attributing things on the outside to our internal biochemistry. This is, in my opinion, this is a disempowering diversion. It allows us to abdicate responsibility. It allows us to say, doctor, you fix us. It allows the medical model to take over, and they gladly will take over. This is the concept of medicalization. Medicalization can be defined as the tendency for the medical model, representatives of the medical model, medical corporations, doctors themselves, not necessarily individual representatives. I don't want to necessarily get off on or start attacking doctors or individuals. The doctors and nurses may be very well, kind and good people. They may be decent human beings. What medicalization really refers to is the tendency of corporations, which are at their very core anti-humanity. A corporation is a fake human being. It's an artificial, synthetic, fabricated human being that has everything, does everything that a human being does or has all the rights that a human being does, except it doesn't die, it doesn't have to eat, and it doesn't have a family that it's responsible for. That's the problem with this corporatocracy that we live under. We live under a world that's run by fake human beings, which is what a corporation is, synthetic human beings, government-created government, government created human beings that have all the, pro, all the rights of a human but don't have, all the, uh, that don't have a soul. They don't have to worry about the same things that we humans do. This is the problem with corporations. And it's one thing if you've got corporations that are ripping us off in, in the world of uh, hardware, in the world of materialism, but when we have corporations that are ripping us off in the world of of health, that is insidious and evil. There's nothing more evil than that. When you have a corporation that is making its decisions on based on the bottom line, and then it's purporting to take care of our health and the health of our loved ones, well, that's just twisted. Corporations bleed green. Their only obligation is the, to the bottom line, and drug companies and medical associations and insurance companies and their government poodles, their government lapdogs, uh, and their representatives who are, are positioning themselves for lucrative post-government opportunities to represent these corporations, these are the ones who are overseeing our health. These are the ones who are taking over what should be our personal obligations and responsibilities to take care of our health and the health of our families on our own. And we're talking about liver health here, and listen up, folks. When it comes to the health of the liver, and liver disease is epidemic and it's getting worse, when it comes to the health of the liver, there is nothing, not a zippo, zero, a doctor or a drug or a surgical procedure can do to improve the health of the liver. Nothing. The medical model is just not equipped for that. And the medical model really has no business sticking its greedy, avaricious, grasping, creepy, little ignorant, predatory nose in our bodies, in our viscera, in our organs. I know I'm getting a little upset here. I don't mean to be. It's just, I've been watching this. I've been watching the medical model destroy our health systematically for the last 30 years that I've been practicing pharmacy. But does this do mean that we're doomed? Does this mean we're doomed to be sick? No. It means we can do it ourselves. One of the manifestations of poor lifestyle choices, of digestive toxicity, of high fructose corn syrup, of fast foods, of prescription drugs, one of the manifest uh, major manifestations of all of these lifestyle decisions is liver disease. They call it NASH, N-A-S-H, or N-A-F-L-D. These are the acronyms, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. That means fatty liver or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It affects over 100 million people. There's only 300 million people in this country. That's one out of three people has fatty liver disease. This is craziness. Then there's the whole issue of hepatitis. We get calls about this uh, hepatitis on this program. I get calls personally, Facebooks, emails about hepatitis. Doctors tell us there's all these viruses that cause hepatitis, and then they try to sell us inexpensive uh, expensive and ineffective medicines to try to mitigate the effects of the hepatitis virus. They say, oh, you got five viruses, A, B, C, D, E, but you don't need expensive $1,000 interferon for your hepatitis which isn't even going to work anyway. It's not like you take your interferon and your, uh, all of a sudden your hepatitis goes away. There isn't any hepatitis medication. They can't do anything for hepatitis. The pharmacal, pharmacomedical model cannot do anything about hepatitis. They can take your liver out or they can transplant it and, and make no mistake about it. They want to. There's not enough livers to go around. That's the only thing that keeps people, keeps the medical model from taking your liver out and putting it out. But you know what they're doing now? They're planning and they're figuring out how they can grow a liver in a Petri dish. 
so they can give you a, a grown liver, a synthetic liver. That's what's on the way, folks. That's our medical model for us, or for you. Okay, so uh, let's see. Got lots more to say about the liver. I'm gonna tell you about some foods here and some amino acids, and super amino acid also has a very important role to play liver health. We'll talk about that when we come back from our break. I'm we got a letter today, we got a letter yesterday from a gal. She's got the fecal body odor. That's got to be something terrible. She says, on antibiotics, she uh, she's listened to the show, and she says uh, she says she can do sugar. Huh, I don't know what she means by that. I don't think, it's mentioned how small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is closely related to female problems, and it's interesting that I suffered with fibroids for five years. I bleed straight, and just last year in May, I had an aborting fibroid the size of a mouse just literally protrude out of me until my GYN removed it. I asked him what caused it, he said, genetics. Oh my God. Listen guys, if you got fibroids, if you have endometriosis, if you have female health issues, you have more than likely a digestive problem and more than likely it relates to bacteria in the gut. And bacteria in the gut, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and sugar metabolism and female health issues and liver disease all go hand in hand. Hepatitis should be thought of first and foremost as something suppressing your immune system. And when that happens, you want to think about digestive health and digestive wellness always. As we've said, the liver processes food. It does a lot of things, but it's mainly, or not mainly, but it's in large part a, a food processing organ. It processes toxins as well, of course, but it also processes hormones. But in large part, it's a food processing system, fats protein, amino acids, sugar. That's a lot of work. That means the best way to keep your liver healthy is to do the same things we do when we keep any other system in the body healthy. The hepatitis alphabet soup, hepatitis A and B and C, just adds more confusion to what should be a simple matter, the health of the body. Hepatitis A and B or acute hepatitis, or uh, emergency hepatitis, hepatitis C is chronic hepatitis, hepatitis D and E are very similar to hepatitis B and A. Basically, you have acute hepatitis and you have chronic hepatitis, and it doesn't matter what the type of virus is that causes it. You've got a liver problem. Remember, the medical model thrives on confusion. It thrives on fear. This is why your prescriptions are written in Latin. Why do you think you, you get your prescription, and aside from the fact that you, I don't even know if they, they fax them these days probably, they print, them, or they print them on a computer these days, but when I was practicing pharmacy, they would handwrite the prescriptions and nobody, including me, uh, I used to have to call the, the doctor to, to ask him what the heck he was talking about or what he was trying to say because I couldn't read his handwriting and they used to think that was funny, by the way. It's not funny. And the prescription would be in Latin. What's the point of writing your prescription in Latin? So you don't know what it is. Only the pharmacist and the doctor understand it. It's, it's confusion and fear and obfuscation, just like governments and political systems and legal systems. The medical model is like the IRS. It profits on fear. It makes its money on fear and confusion. It thrives on us giving up and saying, you take care of me. The medical model wants to be our daddy. But unlike our daddy, unlike our real parent who loves and nurtures us, the medical model does not want us to be strong and brave and independent. It wants us to be weak and scared and dependent. And every time we go to the doctor and pay attention to his advice and get butchered or drugged for what really is lifestyle issues, we become more scared and more dependent. And this, my friends, is our health system. This is why we have degenerative diseases that are going through the roof this is why degenerative diseases don't improve when we go to the doctor. This is why degenerative diseases have become epidemic as the medical model has become stronger and more prevalent in our culture. The medical model has presided over our degenerative disease crisis that is affecting one out of every two or three Americans. Our test scores might improve, but our health doesn't. We're going to love our numbers. That's what the commercial says. You'll love your numbers. That's what the commercial for the new drug for diabetes says. Love your numbers. Not you're going to love your health. You're going to love your numbers because that's what medicine does. It medicates our numbers. It treats our numbers. So what do we do to improve liver health or to uh, prevent hepatitis or to reverse hepatitis? Simple. First of all, we change the way we eat, especially around sugar and sugar intake, and of course, as you know, if you've listened to this program, that means 
bread and pasta and potatoes and, and rice and, and uh, cereals and fruit juice and processed foods of all kinds. Use probiotics. Folks, if you have a liver problem, use probiotics and eat fermented foods. There is an intimate connection between the microbiome, that is the universe of bacteria that live in the gut, and liver health. Eat less foods. Give the liver less work to do. If you have hepatitis, you should be fasting regularly. The liver's processing food. The less food you eat, the less work it's going to have to do, the more resources your body and the liver will have to do its work. God forbid if you have cancer, same thing. I talked to a guy who has stage 4 cancer yesterday. I went to a longevity meeting yesterday. And uh, I talked to a guy, he, uh, a politician, a local politician here in town. He has stage 4 cancer. And I told him, the, and I'm telling you, I'll tell everybody, the less work your body has to do processing food, the more energy and resources it will have available to it to fight cancer, to prevent cancer, to fight diseases of all kinds. This is why fasting and caloric restriction are so important. Cal calories and food and digestion take work. That's work that should be, uh, that, uh, it's resources that the body should be spending on healing and anti-aging and youthfulness and sex and happiness and energy and exercise and all the things we like about life. But if it's off spending its energy digesting food, that means it has less wherewithal to fight disease and to give us all the, uh, the energy to do our lives. Use digestive enzymes. That's another way you can take the load off of the digestive system. Support fat metabolism. Use supplements. Use the Mighty 90. Make sure you're on the Ultimate Selenium. These are all for the liver. Use the Ultimate Selenium. Selenium is very important for liver health. So is zinc. So is vitamin C. One of my all-time favorite supplements, especially for the liver. Massively important liver supplements. So important that it's emergency room medicine in, for liver poisoning. It's N-acetylcysteine, N-A-C. It's an unbelievable supplement for liver health, but for everything. It's great for hangovers. Take some NAC before you go out drinking. Take some NAC while you're drinking. Take some NAC the next morning. You won't have a hangover because the NAC will support liver metabolism and alcohol processing. Vitamin A is especially important for liver health. And so is vitamin E. 20,000 international units of vitamin A. 400 international units of vitamin E. And not coincidentally, vitamin A and vitamin E and selenium and zinc are very important for estrogen processing and for testosterone processing. So if you're a woman dealing with estrogenic health issues or if you're a man dealing with low T, focus on the liver, use vitamin A, use vitamin E, use zinc, use vitamin C, all these liver nutrients. And by the way, when you're on your vitamin E, look for tocotrienols. That's the deluxe premium form of vitamin E, a little harder to find, a little more expensive, but worth it. Tocotrienols, T-O-C-O-T-R-I-E-N-O-L-S, tocotrienols. Tocopherols, the other form of vitamin E, are also good, but the tocotrienols are the deluxe premium form of vitamin E. And then there's arginine, which can be very helpful. Super important for the uh, su uh, super important amino acid for the liver. In fact, you can use arginine medicinally to treat liver disease. There was an article that was published in the journal Nutrition a couple of years ago, where researchers showed that oral arginine supplements significantly improve liver functioning in acute liver poisoning. This makes perfect sense, considering arginine's overall benefits for helping improving health and rebuilding traumatized tissue. I'm pharmacist Ben. Okay, we're going to continue talking about arginine and the liver. Arginine is important for lots of things, but we're going to talk about how it's important for the liver. And it turns out that arginine is also important for cholesterol metabolism. There's a lot of literature that shows that you can lower your dose of statin drugs or maybe even completely eliminate your statin drugs by using arginine supplements. And when I talk about supplementing with arginine, I'm talking about one to five grams of arginine a day. You can buy arginine in capsules or in tablets. Personally, I like arginine powder. It does taste pretty lousy. Those four nitrogens make it very, very alkaloid or basic or uh, just nasty tasting. If you're a chemist, it's because of the, the, the alkalinity of the arginine, but you don't have to be a chemist to know this stuff tastes lousy. So if you're going to put it in your smoothie, you don't want to put too much in your smoothie because it will make your smoothie taste pretty, pretty bad, and you certainly don't want to... Uh, don't want to use your arginine powder straight in water because it really does taste bad. But it is an amazing supplement, and everybody who's interested in anti-aging or who's got wound healing issues wants to be using 
a little bit of arginine, one to five grams a day. Arginine, by the way, can be used topically, and we'll talk about that either tomorrow or the next day. We'll talk about how you can use arginine topically. I've been putting arginine in my glycolic acid formulations for many years. It turns out that arginine can actually have a very beneficial effect on the skin, and it can help improve the effects of alpha-hydroxy acids on the skin. Alpha-hydroxy acids like glycolic acid are well known for stimulating collagen production. Arginine is a is a youth promoting and, and bodybuilding supplement. So it should come as no surprise that by mixing a little arginine with your alpha hydroxy acids, you can improve the skin health benefits associated with alpha hydroxy acids like glycolic acid and lactic acid, which can be very, very helpful for improving photo damage and improving uh, uh, the softness and smoothness of skin and just making your skin look better. We'll talk about that here in the next few days as we continue discussing the health benefits with of super amino acid, which is what I call arginine. Okay, thanks for joining us on the Bright Side. We've been talking about arginine. I love this stuff. I actually got a Facebook post and I re responded to it. Somebody uh, was on, uh, was taking arginine and felt like they were getting some kind of brain fog issues and a dizziness. I think he said his okay, headaches. I gotta, I'm gonna, I'll read his, his post here in our next segment. Uh, in any case, I know of no toxicity associated with arginine and I responded uh, this way to, to this gentleman. Uh, I know of no toxicity associated with arginine. Arginine is considered to be a conditionally essential amino acid. Essential in the world of nutrition, as most of you know, means you absolutely, positively must have the stuff in your diet or supplements because your body can't make it and it's as necessary as air or water. An essential nutrient is as necessary as air. And an essential nutrient is something you can't make, which means you got to supplement with it or you got to get it in your diet. Now, arginine is not, it doesn't have that status. It's not considered essential. It's considered conditionally essential. And there's some uh, uh, other amino acids that are that way. Glutamine in particular is conditionally essential. And that basically means that while it's not an absolute, absolute must have and you could survive without supplementing or, or getting it in your diet, it's probably a good idea. In other words, most of us aren't going to be making as much arginine or glutamine or other conditionally essential nutrients as we need, so it's probably a good idea to supplement. And in the case of arginine, there is zero toxicity. And you can go on Scholar, Google, you can go anywhere you want. And I, I've been researching this stuff for a long time. If there is something, uh, some kind of toxicity associated with arginine, I don't, I don't know of any, and I don't even know any mechanism, although I, I suppose uh, anything's possible. And that's, uh, that's really the bottom line when it comes to supplementing. It doesn't matter what I tell you. It doesn't matter what the literature says. It matters how you feel when you take something. And if you're absolutely positively sure that you're reacting in a certain way, don't let anybody tell you that that's not true. Don't let, I'm not going to tell you that. You shouldn't let any medical professional tell you that. If your experience is that you take something and you don't feel good, you feel uncomfortable or whatever, and you're pretty sure it's associated with whatever you're taking, don't take it. Even if the doctor or, or the literature tells you that there's no way it could be problematic. In any case, arginine is supremely non-toxic. In fact, arginine is used by the body's detox system. It's one of the ways we clear out toxins is, is via arginine and arginine's participation in a very, very interesting, which we'll talk about maybe next week, a very interesting detoxification pathway that occurs in the kidneys. In any case, arginine uh, is related to the liver. We've been talking about how arginine uh, and other nutrients relate to liver health issues. Liver health issues affect 100 million people or more in this country. Can you imagine? a health crisis that affects 100 million people? Well, of course, there's lots of health crisis, crises that affect that many people. Prediabetes and diabetes affects 100 million people in this country. Degenerative diseases, uh, autoimmune diseases, I should say, and degenerative diseases as well affect probably close to 100 million people. We got a sick culture. And liver health issues go part and parcel with generalized disease. The liver processes lots of things. And when the liver breaks down, it's more than likely something else is going to show up as a disease. Something, some kind of disease is going to show up once the liver breaks down. The liver is processing amino acids. It's processing protein. It's processing sugar and fat and toxins in food. It's processing and detoxifying prescription medication. It's producing bile, which is not only important for digesting food, but also important for hormone health, also important for heart health. This, this link between uh, cardiovascular disease and, and bile is very underappreciated. The link between cardiovascular disease and, and because of bile's connection uh, to cardiovascular disease, the link between heart health and, and the diet 
and the digestive system is also very underappreciated, in my opinion. And this is this is missed a lot when people go in for cardiovascular health problems to the cardiologist, and they want to do a bypass, and they want to put put you on medication, beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. How often does the cardiologist check out your digestive system? Check out whether you're making enough bile. Check out your gut, your a gut bacteria dysbiosis. There's a very important connection between between bacteria in the gut and cardiovascular health issue. This is why we're always backtracking to the digestive system no matter what your health crisis is. If you want to quickly get to if you want to quickly get some results or quickly get some relief, go to the digestive system. Always 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 and the the liver is in a sense a jumping off point between digestive health and wellness and other symptoms because of all the things the liver does. The liver's a digestive structure and then it does lots of other things as well. So when the liver is overworked from processing foods, you got food allergies or problems with gut bacteria, it's a very simple matter for the uh, for the liver to jump off, for, for problems in the liver I should say, to jump off and become problems in the heart, problems in the brain, problems in the bones, problems in the muscles, problems all over. And if your cardiologist or rheumatologist or any other doctor isn't backtracking to the liver and the digestive system, you may want to remind him to do so, or you may want to do it yourself. Okay, we're coming back on the bright side. I'm Pharmacist Ben. Got an email, or got a Facebook, I should say, from Paul. He says, he, uh, arginine took me for a loop. Ben, arginine took me for a loop. I'm pre-diabetic with elevated cholesterol and borderline high blood pressure. I took it to help regulate things. Well, first of all, that's a problem right there. But let me continue. I feel like my brain is swollen. I'm lethargic and flush. I know it's the arginine because I've experimented. Can you tell me what's up? Thanks. Well, a couple things come to mind when I read this note. First of all, you don't, and, and this is so important, and I'm, I'm partially guilty of encouraging, encouraging this misunderstanding, but this is a really, really important misunderstanding and something we want to clear up. We really need to clear up if we're going to understand how to use nutrition and nutritional supplementation. You don't want to take this for that. This is, this is the medical model. The medical model gives you this for that. Oh, I have arthritis, I'll get, give you prednisone. Or you have a headache, you take aspirin. Or you have stomach problem, we'll give you Pepto-Bismol. And you take this for that. That's called the medical model. That's called allopathic medicine. That's what the medical model's about, allopathic medicine. Allo means against. A-L-L-O is the Latin prefix for against. Pathy, P-A-T-H is the Latin a term for disease. Allopathic means against disease. You fight disease. That's not what nutrition does. You don't take nutrition to fight disease. You take nutrition to build a healthy body. This is such an important, if subtle, distinction. Nutrients build a healthy body. Then the body does the work. If we're still, if we're taking this for that, arginine for for cholesterol, or or vitamin C for a cold, or or zinc for acne, or what do I take for my for my high blood pressure, or what do I take for my for my um, autoimmune disease? We're trying to apply the allopathic medical model to nutrition, and it doesn't work that way. Nutrients are fuel and raw materials for the body to do its work. A lack of arginine can certainly cause a problem, but that doesn't mean you take arginine to block a specific health issue. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Arginine is a conditionally essential nutrient that we need for zillions, well maybe not zillions, but a lot of different reasons. It does a lot of different things in the body. But you don't want to think about this in this doctor allopathic fashion. I, I'm going to take arginine because I have high cholesterol. You take arginine or you use arginine because it's an essential or conditionally essential nutrient that is important for the health of the body. The body will take care of your elevated cholesterol and your high blood pressure and your thyroid and any, anything else because that's the way the body works. It's in the body's nature to heal itself. All we got to do is give the body the raw materials to do its work. We don't have to worry about taking this for that. That's the first thing that comes to mind when I hear somebody say I'm taking arginine. In this case, I'm taking arginine to help regulate things. The second thing is, is uh, you always want to go by your personal experience. Even though I know of no way uh, it's possible that arginine can cause somebody to have feel like their brain is swollen and be lethargic and flush, and if, if this gentleman has other symptoms, I would certainly be thinking that it has something to do with the other symptoms. But that having, that having been said, personal experience always trumps theory. I'm giving you theory. I'm giving you general ideas. I'm giving you concepts based on my 30 years or nearly 30 years of experience in this business. But... 
it's your personal experience that at the end of the day counts. So, Paul, if you're absolutely sure it's arginine, and every time you take arginine, your brain is swollen, you're lethargic and flush, I can't think of how that works, but it doesn't matter what I think. It matters how you feel after you use a supplement. And you may want to reduce your dose on the arginine. You may want to take it in divided doses if you're taking too much. Uh, but the problem with blaming arginine, if it's really not the arginine, is something else, is you may be missing something. So I, I can't help you with this because I don't know how arginine could ever cause a problem like that. But it doesn't really matter what I think. It matters how you feel at the end of the day. Okay. So I want to say that about arginine, uh, really one of the most non-toxic of all the nutritional supplements you could take, and you could take a lot of it. I've personally been taking five grams, maybe six, five to six days a week for years. Okay, let's see. If we are, uh, as far as liver health goes, uh, arginine is a major, major, major liver health nutrient. It's critical for, it's used actually as medicine uh, for acute liver injuries. Arginine helps clear out hormones. If you have any female health issues, PMS, endometriosis, fibroids, these should all be regarded as liver health issues, and arginine may help you. And as I said before our break, pretty much all degenerative disease is somehow going to have a liver health component, even if it doesn't appear that way. Even if it, th it appears that your symptoms are somehow unrelated to the liver or the digestive system, when you consider the fact that the liver is so multifunctional, it does so many different things, it's so critical to the way we eat and the way we drink and the way we live our lives. If we take prescription drugs, the likelihood of liver breakdown increases. If, uh, there's so many reasons why the liver is involved in our health that if you're dealing with any kind of health issue, even if it doesn't seem that way, there's pretty much, it's pretty, sh it's pretty much a sure thing that there's some kind of liver health issue involved. And the longer we're taking our prescription drugs, by the way, the more likely uh, liver health is going to be compromised. And this is something that doesn't show up on the package insert. The package insert, which everybody should read, in my opinion, my pharmacist opinion, if you're on a drug, you want to read the package insert. Doctors hate when you read the package insert. And I used to get in trouble giving patients the package insert. But nonetheless, if you go get a prescription, get the package insert, which will describe all the potential adverse reactions and side effects. The thing about the liver is it's, it may not necessarily show up. Liver health problems may not necessarily show up as a side effect, but because the liver is doing all the work, and the more drugs you're on, the more work it's doing, it's pretty, there's a pretty good chance that if you're on a prescription drug for a long period of time, for, for weeks or months or years, your liver is going to be bearing the brunt and, and liver compromise is likely on some level. Prednisone and other steroid hormone drugs, estrogen replacement therapy, are especially burdensome on the liver, not surprisingly, because the liver is a hormone processing organ in addition to a drug processing organ. If you're menopausal, and nearly 20% of women are menopausal, you want to pay especially close attention to the health of your liver. And by the way, as far as symptoms of menopause go, the hot flashes, the anxiety, the mood changes, the insomnia, the night sweats, you couldn't possibly put together a more accurate description of a stressed out body, a generalized stress response. Remember, we got these two nervous systems. We got the relaxation nervous system and the stress nervous system. And menopausal symptoms, in my opinion, are best regarded as signs that the body is in a generalized stress emergency way of functioning. And liver health, or lack of liver health, and emergency mode functioning, stress functioning, go hand in hand. So what do we do to improve liver health? Well, first of all, no surprise here, we change the way we eat. That's the first thing you want to do always, but especially when you have a major digestive structure like the liver. Real simple strategy is to simply eat less food, simply getting less calories in your body. That's the reason why every single study on longevity shows that you live longer when you eat less. It's a good idea to dramatically reduce sugar intake as well because, of course, the liver's processing sugar. Same with fats and processed fats, I should say, especially processed fats because the liver's clearing those out too. Okay, a couple more things I'll tell you when we come back from our break. Okay, so we are talking about the super amino acid, arginine. We're talking liver health, and not surprisingly, arginine and liver health are connected. Arginine is a major detox amino acid. It's a major liver health amino acid. It's been used to treat liver injury. It can help improve blood flow to the liver. It can improve the symptoms of fatty liver disease. If you're one of the 100 million Americans who are dealing with fatty liver disease, in addition to using arginine, there's a lot of non-doctor and non-medical strategies that you can use to improve the health of the liver. 
By the way, there's also an important relationship between cholesterol and statin drugs and arginine, which we'll be talking about here in a second. So what do you do to improve liver health? It's simple. First of all, change the way we eat. The liver is a digestive organ. Changing the way we eat, a simple strategy, just eating less food. It's always a good idea to eat less food. It's always a good idea to eat dramatically less sugar. The liver, in addition to being a digestive organ, is also a sugar processing organ. This is so important because the liver is where point one on our triangle of disease becomes point two on our triangle of disease. The triangle of disease is the digestive system, which breaks down first, then the blood sugar system, and, uh, which breaks down second, and then the adrenal thyroid complex, which breaks down third, and from there all disease shows up, which means, as we said so many times on this program, if you're dealing with heart disease, if you're dealing with skin issues, if you're dealing with eye health issues, macular degeneration or glaucoma or cataracts, if you're dealing with autoimmune problems, if you're dealing with cancer, if you have high blood pressure, no matter what it is, backtrack, work backwards to the adrenal, uh, the thyroid and the adrenal glands, the blood sugar system and the digestive system. The liver is the jumping off point between point A and point B, the digestive system and the blood sugar system. The liver does both. It helps us process our food, and it helps us process sugar. So eating less sugar, eating less food. You can use probiotics. There's also a very important relationship between liver health and good bacteria. Eating fermented foods, using digestive enzymes, supporting fat metabolism. These are all for any kind of liver health issue, whether it's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, so-called NAFLD. Now they're calling it NASH, or whether you have hepatitis, or if you're on a prescription drug, or if you just want to keep your liver healthy. Support fat metabolism, use bile salts, use magnesium, use the ultimate selenium, make sure you're taking zinc. One of my all-time favorite liver support supplements is NAC. It's emergency room, pro part of the emergency room protocol for living liver poisoning. Don't forget about vitamin C, the primal panacea, very, very important for the health of the liver. So is vitamin A, so is vitamin E. Take 20,000 international units of vitamin A a day, 400 international units of vitamin E. You can use either the tocopherol form or the deluxe premium tocotrienol form, which is a little harder to find and a little bit more expensive. And then there is arginine, super amino acid, as I call it. Arginine can be very helpful for the liver. As I said earlier, arginine can be used medicinally to treat liver disease in an article that was published in the journal Nutrition. Researchers showed that oral supplements of arginine significantly improved liver function in acute liver poisoning. Of course, this makes perfect sense because arginine is a healing amino acid. It's a wound healing and an anti-trauma amino acid. It's not so much that arginine is specific for the liver, although it does have some liver support properties because it's a detox amino acid. It's more like Arginine is important for tissue regeneration and post-traumatic healing of all kinds, burns, wounds, surgery, scrapes, any kind of wounding or, or broken tissue or any kind of injury can benefit from arginine supplementation.